last year in the September time frame, ISA 100 wireless was approved as the international IEC standard 62734. As it was published, it included uh, capabilities that uh, ensure that the standard was compliant with ETSI PN 300, 320 version 1.8.1. Uh, and that's essentially the um, requirement for co coexistence of ISA 100 wireless devices with other devices transmitting on a 2.4 gigahertz band. Some call it uh, listen before talk, but there are many other features that wrap around it as well. Interesting news this year, one of our members, Gas Secure, uh, submitted their gas detector for SIL certification. They achieved uh, SIL 2 certification. This is a first for wireless gas detection. Um, sometimes we're asked about availability of ISA 100 wireless communication modules and stacks. There's information on the website about that, but today there are uh, wireless modules and stacks available from four uh, suppliers. The first was Nivis, that's been around for some time. A recent addition is Murata, their global uh, electronic uh, component supplier. Um, Yokogawa has uh, a stack and so does Honeywell. Typically Yokogawa and Honeywell, they're large vendors, so they're typically uh, uh, partnering and sharing stacks with their partners and uh, on a one-off basis. So uh, that's the story on the stacks. So the progress of uh, new ISA 100 wireless devices has been um, increasing. So this year between January and June, there were 15 uh, new devices added to the product portfolio. Um, of those, about half of them have been uh, certified, and uh, the rest are uh, slated for certification sometime in Q3 or Q4 of this year. Certification is important uh, for us. It's an important mission to ensure interoperability, so any supplier's device is going to work in any other manufacturer's ISA 100 wireless network. As long as they're uh, certified, we can assure that. So today, there's 44 devices in the uh, portfolio. Uh, there'll be more than 50 by the uh, Q4 of this year. Uh, certified device count is 25, uh, with the addition of others slated for certification this year. We should have 33 or more by the end of uh, 2015. So I would encourage you to visit the, our website uh, there's a nice white paper that uh, Jay authored um, uh, at the beginning of the year. You can download that. Um, there's news and details about our uh, wireless demo at the Akama show in Frankfurt in June. We hosted three live networks with 36 devices from 17 vendors. And, you know, again, an attestment to um, our certification testing, these devices were all uh, combined and assembled into the networks on site um, and the interoperability uh, certification testing that we do is proven out. All that integration work was done one, one day in advance of the show without any hitches. So you can find a full list of registered devices on the website, use cases and customer stories. Uh, we're finding more and more interest in uh, this technology uh, at this time we're receiving greater than 20,000 visitors per month to the website. So I would encourage you to, uh, to visit that website. So um, let's go ahead with the scheduled webinar. Uh, Jay Werb, our technical director, uh, will be presenting. He uh, was the uh, author or the, I should say editor of the data link layer on the ISA 100.11a standards committee when the uh, standard was originally drafted um, at ISA. So uh, we'll cover um, applications supported by ISA 100 uh, devices and systems, the network architecture, and then a general overview of the uh, 62734 standard. So Jay? Okay, thanks Andre. 
Um, the last time I gave an introductory webinar like this was over four years ago, so it's pretty much time for an update. It's pretty amazing how far we've come since then. Um, you know, let's start by talking about why people are using wireless instrumentation in the first place. Uh, first, cost savings are at the top of most lists for wire industrial wireless. Up to 90% of the installed cost of wired technology relates to the wiring itself, such as cable, conduit, related construction. Um, wireless makes those costs go away. Another advantage is that a wireless instrument can be moved for, ver for very little cost. Wireless projects can be completed much more quickly. Typically, a wireless project takes one-fifth the time and at one-half the cost. So when you add wireless to your instrumentation strategy, new applications become feasible at a reasonable cost, and existing applications can be scaled. Second, improved reliability is another justification for wireless. Wires can corrode in difficult environments. In some situations, wireless can actually be more reliable than failure-prone wires. Also, a redundant wireless system can provide an independent communication channel when it runs alongside a wired solution. Third, improved control is a common justification for wireless. A control system can be optimized by adding wireless points to existing, an existing solution. These factors together, cost savings, improved reliability, and improved control, are causing rapid adoption of wireless for, for industrial instruments. Um, I like to use this diagram to summarize the major use cases for wireless instrumentation. This diagram is derived from the ISA 100 application classes that people have been using for years. Starting from the bottom of the diagram, monitoring and compliance applications track the status of equipment or of a process state, for example, temperature or vibration. Condition monitoring refers to the condition of equipment such as steam traps or valves. Process monitoring refers to the process itself such as pressure. Moving up to the next level, alerts and alarms track the status of a process state, such as temperature or safety state, such as a gas level. Exceptions are reported to an operator for appropriate action. Alarms are a rapidly growing area for industrial wireless. Then moving up to the next level, we have control applications, where wireless is somehow involved in a control loop. Open loop means that a user is in the loop, and closed loop means that the loop is, is automated. Closed loop applications are sometimes divided into outer loop and inner loop. And at the top of the ISA 100 hierarchy, we have automated safety instrumented systems, or SIS. The, the empty box in the diagram indicates that wireless SIS is technically feasible, but to my knowledge, is not being done much today. Wireless safety alarms, yes. Wireless SIF, not so much yet. So we have three general types of applications that are commonly mentioned for ISA 100 wireless. Process monitoring and control applications provide information from a process. In most cases, wireless is used to provide visibility that was not economically feasible with the wire. Health monitoring and analytics report the status of equipment. These applications provide early warning of equipment failure that can eventually disrupt the process. Safety applications for wireless generally involve safety alarms, for example, gas detection. Exceptions are detected by the system and reported to an operator. Today, responses to wireless safety alarms are usually not automated. So diving down a little, um, process monitoring and control applications typically involve temperature, pressure, flow, pH, dissolve O2, dissolve O2 and various other things. Valve position is a little bit of a special case. We're seeing classic positioners coming to market in wireless forms, but we're also seeing simpler and very basic wireless position sensors. 
Um, on the right, I've listed a few general wireless requirements for this class of applications. First, scalability. ISA 100 wireless suppliers tend to put high scalability at the top of their list of requirements. Second, low and deterministic latency. This goes hand in hand with scalability. Different devices and applications can have very different requirements at the same time and on the same network. ISA 100 wireless is designed to support latency down to about one-tenth of a second in control configurations. Third, flexible configuration goes along with the scalable network. You can start small and scale as needed. Fourth, predictable battery life is another essential requirement. With the right system design, battery re replacement shouldn't be a big deal. Many devices have a service interval when you need to touch the device anyway. In an ISA 100 system, you should not need to touch the device just to change its battery. Fifth, multi-vendor multi interoperability is, of course, why we have standards in the first place. Okay, let's do the same thing for asset health monitoring and analytics. This is a, this is a rapidly blowing class of applications. Condition monitoring usually involves monitoring the condition of equipment to identify a developing fault. These applications have been doable technically for a long time, but it can be hard to justify an expensive wire just to monitor whether equipment is working correctly. With wireless, it becomes practical to monitor equipment at hundreds or even thousands of points in a plant. Vibration monitoring applies to rotating equipment. Sophisticated algorithms analyze the vibration waveform to predict a failure. Corrosion monitoring checks the condition of pipes using non-destructive testing techniques. Steam trap monitors can use ultrasonic signatures or other approaches to detect when a steam trap needs to be serviced. In all of these cases, the objective is usually to give maintenance people enough notice so that they can service dicey equipment before it becomes an operational problem. Looking at the wireless requirements again, we see scalability again with large range of data rates. This, the large range of data rates is essential when wireless is used for monitoring, control, and safety all at the same time. Similarly, the network needs to be able to prioritize data flows. Slowly changing monitoring data should not affect real-time performance needed by alarming and control applications. Support for large waveforms allows sophisticated analysis of equipment, um, of equipment condition, and flexible network configuration allows sensors to be installed in all of the weird locations where equipment can fail, and for sensors to be moved from place to place as needed. Okay, and again, let's do the same thing for safety alarms. Sometimes people are surprised to hear that wireless devices are being used for safety alarms. In actual practice, safety is probably the fastest growing use of ISA 100 wireless. Yokogawa reports that over 50% of their wireless instrumentation projects involve alarms that require a one to 10 second update period. Alarming involves an out of bounds condition that is reported to a user or to a system. Applications include gas detection, fire detection, level detection, and many others. Generally, an out-of-bounds condition is reported to a user who needs to take action. Control and reliable, controlled and reliable quality of service is the key requirement for alarms. An open architecture is also important because safety-related applications may have specialty requirements. One example is, the prof is that the ProfiSafe protocol has been implemented to ISA 100 and the wireless system that does that has achieved SIL-2 safety certification. All right, so now let's take a peek at change gears a little bit and look at various network architectures in the world of ISA 100 wireless. Okay, so this picture is a little complicated, but we'll go through it. On the left, we show a typical ISA 100 network diagram. It shows a variety of field devices for multiple vendors. 
These devices can all play nicely together on one network. As shown here, they connect to a redundant pair of nearby access points. Some connections are direct to the access points, while others are indirect through the mesh. Connections are redundant, so that if any single connection has a problem, there is always an instant feedback. Fall, fallback, excuse me. There is also redundancy at the gateway and system manager level. On the right, we show the essence of the scalability model. To get started with a few devices, you can have a standalone network. This approach works fine as long as your applications are not too demanding and you don't have a lot of devices. Now you can scale your system by installing a lot of little standalone networks at the same site. I call that scaling by duplication. That, that is roughly the same idea as going to Best Buy and installing 75 home networks for an office with 75 people. ISA 100 vendors usually don't recommend scaling using that approach. In the ISA 100 world, the next step up is, called, is labeled plant-wide network. A plant-wide network is not a lot of little networks. It is a plant-wide resource, just like Wi-Fi or Ethernet. You design a plant-wide resource with reasonable care, and the plant-wide network should be designed for high reliability and scalability. ISA 100, ISA 100 supports a feature called Duocast for latency-sensitive reporting, and the protocol does scale to many, many devices. At the enterprise level, we start getting into the Internet of Things, the so-called Internet of Things, where the vision is big data aggregation across all of the networks in the enterprise. For example, remote wellhead monitoring would be a good candidate for, inter for Internet of Things approaches. For that kind of network, you need an architecture that scales globally. ISA 100 Wireless leverages IPv6, which is a 128-bit addressing scheme for scaling the Internet. Using IPv6, you can scale your network across the enterprise however it makes sense for your applications without any addressing limitations. Okay, here's, here's a figure that illustrates the flexibility of an ISA 100 wireless network. Here, we show an example of a mesh network with devices from different manufacturers doing different things. Some devices use native ISA 100 wireless application interface, while others use ISA 100 op objects with a different application interface. Just like any IP network, different interfaces can, can be supported at the same time and on the same network. ISA 100 Wireless is an open, flexible framework that accommodates non-native application interfaces. Some really interesting examples are available today. To the right of the diagram, we show two legacy heart devices wired to a controller. At the same time, those devices can report stranded diagnostics to the ISA 100 network via heart adapters. Another, as another example, from a company called GasSecure, we have gas sensors using Profisafe over ISA 100. They recently received SIL2 safety certification for that. Another example from 3ETI uses FIPS 140-2 over ISA 100 wireless for military-grade security. Yet another example is from GE Bentley Nevada, which uses a custom interface over ISA 100 wireless for their sophisticated vibration sensors. Similar, similarly, a Honeywell NRAP radar gauge uses a custom interface over ISA 100. All of these examples can work on the same network and at the same time. These examples demonstrate why a flexible IP approach based on the Internet technology allows for lots of innovation on a common network platform. This diagram shows some general guidelines about network performance. We could spend hours on this subject, but I found that this simple diagram focused the, focuses the attention on the key points. On the right, labeled with an A, we show an IP backbone. In wireless sensor network land, you can think of the backbone network as a highway. The backbone is typically a lot faster and more reliable than the wireless sensor connections. 
Next, labeled with a B, we have a seal devices that have a direct connection to the backbone. You can think of this as the on-ramp to the highway. ISA 100 Wireless is designed to provide one-tenth second latency for a connection like this in controlled configuration. In practice, something like one second is more typical. Next, label C, we show plus or minus 10 second latency in the mesh network. Now, the radio signals travel at the speed of light, so what's the holdup in this, in this mesh? Generally, the delays in the mesh network are mostly due to waiting for neighbors to wake up from a deep sleep to save their batteries. So, just like on city streets, you can spend most of your time at traffic lights even though there isn't much traffic. In an ad hoc mesh configuration, battery considerations usually push performance into the 10 plus second range. In controlled configurations, one second is closer to the norm. Finally, labeled with a D, we show peer-to-peer -peer connections, which are back to supporting one second latency. So that, that's similar to a neighborhood where you can quickly walk next door even if there is heavy traffic out on the street. This diagram shows a simple, a simple installation approach that is commonly used. The installer can follow some simple rules, often without a site survey. The result is predictable performance. In this configuration, battery-powered repeaters are installed in locations that have line-of-sight access to line-of-sight to access points. Depending on the antennas used, line-of-sight range can be 500 meters to 3 kilometers. Field devices are located. Um, let's say 50 meters from the repeaters. Based on experience at multiple sites, the 50 meter range from the repeater to a field instrument can be support supported without a survey. You can extend these ranges with surveys or by using high grain antennas. Installations like this provide predictable performance by following some simple rules of thumb. As a real-world example of an ISA 100 network, this diagram shows an actual system offering from Yokogawa. A redundant gateway provides the network brain for up to 20 subnets through IP backbone connections to an ISA 100 wireless access point. Up to 500 field devices are supported per gateway at a five-second update rate. As shown in the diagram, supporting as shown in the diagram. Supported backbone connections include Ethernet, wireless LAN, optical Ethernet, and two-wire cable. Here's another real-world real example. This diagram shows an actual system offering from Honeywell. Two types of networks are offered under this umbrella. On the left, they show field instrument, instruments network which is a small network controlled by a single gateway and manager. And manager. On the right, they show a multi-application network, which is a scalable configuration with full redundancy. One interesting point on the right side of this diagram is that they combine Wi-Fi with ISA 100 wireless. Um, this results in one network that can support a range of applications. Wi-Fi can be used to support full connectivity to wireless workers, security cameras, cameras, things like that. And at the same time, ISA 100 wireless network supports battery-powered industrial instruments. Okay, moving right along. Any introduction to ISA 100 wireless needs to discuss the underlying IEC 62734 standard. And I'll try to keep this at a fairly high level. Okay, there are a few points that usually come up when people list the main features of IEC 62734. First, it is based on an IEEE 802.15.4 radio. There is a robust, a robust supply chain for underlying IEEE standard, and radios are available from various high-quality sources. Second, the standard is FC compliant. Radio regulations in Europe have changed recently. 
IEC 6734 describes exactly how ISA 100 wireless can be configured to achieve compliance. Third, ISA 100 wireless is robust. The protocol uses every available trick on those IEEE radios to support robust performance. Fourth, ISA 100 wireless is secure. As I'll describe a little later, we use AES cryptography at two levels to ensure a secure system. Fifth, the protocol is IP-based and is designed to be as scalable as the Internet itself. And sixth, applications and management are object-based, which is compact and extensible. The object model tunnels support, support tunneling of foreign protocols. This is a diagram from about 10 years ago. ISA 100 Wireless started from a project with the United States Department of Energy. The requirements listed on this slide came from that project based on extensive interviews with users. This diagram shows that ISA 100 Wireless was designed to meet 11 key user re requirements, all at the same time. First, a wireless system must provide state-of-the-art security. This means meticulous application of proven cryptography. Second, it must provide reliable, reliable wireless communication. Users are looking for 24-7 operation with high data in integrity. Third, it must be, provide deterministic power management of battery operators and sensors. When a device is designed for a certain battery life, the device must actually operate for its entire life as designed. Fourth, it must be open, allowing users to select the best products for a given application. Fifth, it must support multi-speed monitoring. Some devices might report every quarter second, while others might report every few minutes, all on the same network. Sixth, it must be multifunctional supporting a range of applications with one system and at the same time. Seventh, it must be scalable seamlessly. It needs to be scalable in numbers to tens of thousands of devices. It needs to be scalable in space, spread over an area that can be measured in miles. And it needs to be scalable in rate, with some devices reporting infrequently and other devices reporting continuously. Scalable also means that the network needs to be manageable at scale. Eighth, it must account for global wireless regulations so that one instrument can be deployed anywhere in the world. Ninth, it must provide predictable quality of service that can be configured by the user to meet particular application requirements. Tenth, it must be multi-protocol at the application layer, compatible with the user's choice of host systems. Wireless systems need to fit seamlessly within the wired application frameworks. And finally, completing the circle and wrapping all this together, you get a standardized interoperable platform that is control ready. Okay, so those were general requirements, and those those are now mapped into more technical requirements on this slide. First, we show rate, rate and latency. ISA 100 has aggressive requirements for rate and latency. The bread and butter is to support a lot of devices with publication rates down to one to, one to two seconds. Latency needs to be controlled. For most applications, latency needs to be less than 50% of the publication rate. ISA 100 Wireless was designed to support latency down to 100 milliseconds in controlled configurations and publication rates of one quarter second or less. Second, mesh networking. Mesh networking is another fundamental ISA 100 Wireless requirement. The wireless mesh network is modeled as an extension of the wired IP backbone which makes the network as scalable as the internet. Mesh and non-mesh technology is supported. The wireless mesh can provide range, range extensions and re 
redundant reporting paths. Peer-to-peer -peer communication is also an important requirement. If two devices are near each other, they shouldn't need to communicate back to the host in order to communicate with each other. An object model provides the function blocks at the device level, and all of this needs to be delivered with long and predictable battery life. Third, reliability is a big deal for wireless networks for industrial applications. A transmission needs to be deterministic, which ensures that each message is received on time. The transmission needs to be accurately received, and it needs to be and it needs to have redundant communication paths so that the network can instantly recover from temporary radio problems. Fourth, security, of course. The transmissions need to be secure. Security authenticates that a received message was from the actual source and that it has not been modified. Security also encrypts every message. This, di this diagram shows two levels of security. Now, security is a complicated subject, of course, but I'll cover it quickly here. ISA 100 wireless has, in ISA 100 wireless, many users checked and approved the security scheme to confirm that we correctly applied the state of the art. These mechanisms are all carefully checked in every certified device. The general idea is that security occurs at two levels end-to-end -end above the UDP protocol, and for each radio connection um, with, at, the, at the data link layer. TL security, or transport layer security, is intended to protect your data. Every message, message is encrypted at the source, and only the final destination can decrypt and, and authenticate the message. This ensures that when a message is received by the gateway, for example, it was correctly transmitted and is authentic and is confidential. Data link layer, or DL security, protects the mesh network. DL security cryptographically verifies that a wireless message was correctly received by a neighbor. If the security codes don't all line up, you get a retry. Now we move on to a quick, quick coverage of robust communications. Um, one important aspect of ISA 100 is that we use every available trick to assure that the radio messages actually get through. This diagram shows that there are lots of potential interferers in an industrial plan, from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth, microwave ovens, other sensor networks, you name it. The other aspect that is not shown is that even without background noise, you can get radio nulls just from the way radio waves bounce off, each, bounce off things in the environment. Fortunately, these kinds of problems tend to be transient and also vary from one radio channel to another. So if you have a problem on one radio channel, ISA 100 will wait a little while and then try again on another radio channel. I said before that ISA 100 is designed for latency down to 100 milliseconds. Now, 100 milliseconds doesn't seem like a long time, but in radio land, 100 milliseconds gives us plenty of time to wait for the radio environment to change and then retry on another channel. In addition to retries on other radio channels, the system also accumulates diagnostics so that the system can make aut automatic adjustments. When a channel isn't working, it can be automatically blacklisted. Also, when a radio path is having difficulty, the network can reorganize itself to use another route. One important concept of wireless is that you should design your system to have a lot of margin. When you start to lose margin, you should see that in your network diagnostics. Your message still gets through, so the user doesn't notice a problem. But the diagnostics are a signal that you are losing margin and that, network design, and that the network design may need some attention. So in summary, ISA 100 has a lot of features under the covers to ensure robust communication and extensive diagnostics to guide people who are, who are responsible for network operations.
Okay. So before we open things up for questions, I'd like to quickly cover the object-oriented application layer. This diagram shows our object-oriented approach to publication. There is an ISA 100 entity called the concentrator object, and the concentrator object can be connected to sensors in a device. Then it can be configured to publish messages periodically, you know, such as every one second, two seconds, five seconds, whatever. The concentrator object can publish any kind of data, which makes our publication approach very flexible. Similarly, we have a reporting object. The alert reporting object can be used to publish conditions when they reach trigger points. An alert can be an event, which is a one-time report, or an alert can be an alarm, which is a state. The alerting, report, the alerting approach is very flexible, and we could discuss that for a long time, but we're out of time, I think, yes. Okay, so in conclusion, um, ISA 100 provides cost savings, improved reliability, improved control, and in the past couple of years of learning can also provide improved safety. And now I'll hand the baton back to Andre for wrap-up and questions. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jay. So um, if uh, you have questions, we have we have time now for a Q&A period. And uh, also, uh, I'll remind everybody that the this uh, webinar and the PowerPoints will be posted to the uh, Wireless Compliance Institute website. It'll, it won't be there this afternoon. It'll be out there uh, sometime uh, tomorrow. And uh, so. Questions? So um, there's a couple questions. I'm not sure if we have the answer answer to this, but um, uh, one participant asked, mentioned uh, the SIL2 certified gas detector and uh, the real reliability about it. But he's wondering about the availability numbers um, for safety applications. His concern is that uh, if used in a closed loop, it'll create nuisance trips. So um, I don't know enough about about that specific application to provide a, a reasonable answer for that. Um, but I'll certainly look it up. Jay, did you have any in, input on that? On how that's being deployed, or? Any numbers on the uh, gas secure product? I, I can get. I could guess, but I'd rather not speculate. We should. We should just go back to them and ask. Okay. So that's what we'll do, and and uh, we'll include answers to that question on the website as well. So. Um, So another question is uh, about the potential for malicious or intentional wireless communications interruptions and how to guard against it. That one would be for you, Jay. So the so the the, the question is how do you deal with denial of service denial of service attacks? That's the way I would yeah. I would interpret that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's a it's a fair question for any wireless, especially on these IEEE radios. I mean, what, one of the um, one of the trade-offs is when you pick an IEEE radio, they're they're well known they're well-known radios that people know how to jam. Yes. So when we st when we started this process, we had a choice of going for you know some some fancy military radios that are very expensive and hard to get your hands on that are harder to jam or the um, or the ISA one or the IEEE radios which everyone which are which can be jammed by all kinds of things um, and the general approach was to make sure that when a message comes through 
it's a good message. We can't ensure that the message we can't ensure that the messages get through if someone's actively trying to jam it. We can we can jump around the frequencies so it's harder. Um, but if someone if someone wants to jam the signal, they can jam the signal. And all we can do is make sure that the system detects that the signal is being jammed. Um, so it instantly comes up on the diagnostic that there's a problem. Um, but you know, if 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 so if someone if someone's out to jam you know a a Wi-Fi system or our system or any you know, anything based on IEEE, um, they can you know if they're on site if they're on site with a jammer they can do it. All we can do all we can do is detect it. Mm. Okay. So. Uh, 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 another question, I'm not exactly sure what's being asked here, but I'll just state the question. Some features of ISA 100, particularly bandwidth leasing, apparently, are not required for compliance. How can an end customer judge the applicability of a vendor's offering? Uh, WCI compatibility does not appear to be sufficient. What does compliance cover? So. Is this question going to ask about interoperability? Um, well, I think that by the bandwidth leasing, they mean the contracts and the uh. and, the, and the, the devices, the mechanism in the device to support contract are not optional. Um, so those are be, those are being tested in our certification process. Um, so they are required for. Well, they're required at the device. They're required at the device at the device level. The systems might the, sy this, the systems might not use all the features, but all the features. You know, um, the you know, there's a fair amount of configurability, and the you know we we test lot we test lots and lots of things on, at the device level, and you know one of the, one of the things we one of the things we test is the contract stuff. Right. So, QoS. Yeah. So there's, um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about, you know, just because something is configurable doesn't doesn't make it optional. The, you know, the um, the systems might choose not to use the features that are in all the devices, but generally most of, most of the feet, you know, most there's very few features at the device level, especially as far as the stack is concerned. Very few features that are optional. Okay. They're configurable, Thanks. but they're not optional. And, and, and if it's there, and if it's required, we test it. Okay. So um, for blacklisting, uh, how long can you blacklist channels? For what time duration? Um, there's there's two parts to that question. There's um, there's regulatory limits to what you can do in Europe under the new Etsy rules, and I don't know exactly what those are. Um, but other, other than that, you know, other than the Etsy requirements, um, you know, in the, in the United States, I'm not aware of any time limitations. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, Etsy, the Etsy and the ISA 100, well, IEC 62734 defines a bunch of different ways to be compliant with Etsy. And certain techniques require that you have 15 channels running at all time. So if you have 15 channels running, then you can then it's, then it's hard to blacklist because you only have 15 channels. Um, so so the question gets a, that question gets a little complicated in Europe. Um, and again, the, the the answer tends to be system specific. Yeah, the, device, yeah. the devices are all the same, but the systems can deal with it different ways. So there's a question that we always get. Uh, um, so, uh, folks ask, um, is ISA 100 really secure because security is optional? And uh, yeah, so. So you know, I've heard that security is optional in ISA 100. Isn't that a security threat? Um, th th this, this again, it's the same concept that there are 
multiple levels of security that are supported at the device level. Um, we test for all we we test for for all of those in our compliance testing. Um, and the security policy itself is that is, is a system level consideration. So. So basically, the ISA 100 standards that, you know, make, make sure that the that the different security levels are supported in all the devices, and then the security policy is a is a, is a system thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you want to say anything more about that, Andre? Or is that um, again, you're the, you're the head of the you're the managing director of the Security Compliance Institute? Maybe you have a different spin on that one. No, I know we test everything, all the security features, and and uh, products are are uh, deployed with security on by default. So um, it, it's, that's just a, an urban myth. So another question is: uh, uh, Does ISA 100 apply only to wireless instruments, or can it include wireless I/O blocks? Um. That's a um, there's a new set of there's a set of specifications that are going to be published um, later this year that um, that start that's that start to define the IO that start to define IO blocks. Or, some, or something that's very similar to I/O blocks with the same functionality. There, so, I'll, so I'll leave it at that. The, um, so we have specs coming out for analog input, analog output, binary input, and binary output, and that that includes the basic stuff you expect in a in those in those blocks. Okay. Um. So we we always get a question about significant differences between ISA 100 and wireless heart, and uh, and then there, is there discussions about future compatibility between the two? So what we try to do is is leave that up to the uh, you know third parties to do those comparisons. I don't it, because if we start comparing them, we're We'll get into the this is better and that's better, and we'd be throwing rocks at each other. And I really don't like to do that. Uh, um, so um, we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> we can leave that to the third parties. I apologize for that one. It's just something that we just don't do. Um, so. There's a question about certified devices on our website. It looks like there's a lot of system devices and not transmitters. Uh, there are, are, I'm not sure what we mean by transmitters. Um, it's a tra transmitters is mostly what's certified. Actually, everything that's certified is a transmitter. Um, so a transmitter yeah. would be would, would be like a Basically, a sensor that transmits stuff. So, so all the all the devices that we certify, the field devices, uh, they're all they all are transmitter devices, and they can uh, be configured to be routing or non-routing, so they can mesh or not mesh. Okay. Um, Yeah, I think I, there are system devices listed. I mean, I don't know the website that well, but there are system devices listed. But I don't think I think those those are the ones that are not certified, as I recall. Yeah. So the certification process is certifying uh, field devices. The um, um, the um, gateways, um, backbone routers. Those are what we would call infrastructure devices. They tend to be more um, Supplier specific, and uh, and so far uh, we're not certifying them. 
you know, we don't, we're, we're not uh, promoting interoperability um, or interchangeability in um, infrastructure devices. And it would be, and, and it's uh, almost always the case that uh, infrastructure devices are, are uh, handled by a single supplier. So similar to wired Ethernet or um, uh, Wi-Fi, you tend to want to go with uh, one supplier for your backbone infrastructure and, and your other infrastructure devices. So when we certify interoperability, we're certifying that any device will work in any of the other um, suppliers' um, infrastructure network. And so in our certification program, we think we have pretty good coverage. Well, we know we do. Uh, we do um, uh, round-robin trials or plug fests, if you will, where, where we rotate devices from one supplier network to another, and they work. And a good case in point uh, is um, at Akama, we had three networks from three suppliers, um, 36 devices from 17 suppliers, and uh, we're able to um, communicate some basic uh, networking parameters to all the participants in that show. They showed up on Saturday with their devices, and we were able to configure them all that day. So um, when we find, if we ever find any issues in inter interoperability trials, and we circle that information back to ensure that we got it covered in the uh, in our certification test. Okay. So, um, Question is: Is uh, ISA 100 network compatible with the wireless heart network? So the answer is no. They use the same basic radio in the two networks, but um, the other technical aspects of it are um, not compatible. For one thing, um, the wireless heart networks uses uh, fixed. I think it's 10 millisecond time slices, and ISA 100 can be configured. Um, uh, you know, with different time slices. Uh, wireless heart, uh, wired heart devices will work in an ISA 100 network using the heart adapters that are available from several suppliers. But wireless heart devices won't work. Okay. So there's a question about uh, are there monitoring tools that will provide network uptime, asset monitoring, et cetera, that can do alarming and SMS messaging. Um, I think that answer better, best comes from uh, the suppliers, but uh, from what I've seen, those are some of the um, those are some of the uh, functions that are supported by. Uh, device suppliers. Yeah, I can, yeah, what the stand, what the ISA 100 standard covers is there's a number of diagnostics that the device is required to be able to collect and report. And then, it's, again, it's up to the system suppliers to pull that together into something that makes sense to the user. Right, so there's a question that says, uh, ask, can it, be, can it be said that the wireless devices or networks are explosion-proof or intrinsically safe? So uh, you can add to this, Jay, but the, um, the radio signals themselves shouldn't uh, set off explosions. It won't set off explosions, but the devices themselves, it's uh, 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 the device packaging. Uh, typically, um, they'll get an ATEX certification for um, explosive environments, so it's going to be on a device-by-device -device level as to whether the integrity of that device is sufficient for meeting the uh, uh, explosion-proof requirements for uh, dangerous environments.
Okay. I think um, I think we're running out of time. I think it's 12 o'clock. So um, I think we're going to have to I think we're going to have to stop here. Uh, there might maybe one more question. Um, so may, Jay, you might be able to help out with this. So. Let's assume that somebody uh, uh, installation has a hundred wireless sensors, for instance, vibration, pressure, temperature. How frequent would the, are the battery changing requirements? Um, that should mostly be driven by the, the by, by the reporting requirements of the device itself, if this if the system is well designed. Um, so, for example, if a device that reports every half second would obviously don't need a lot more battery than a device that supports every 15 seconds. Um, and what you try to do in your system design is to avoid um, you, you try you try to avoid configurations where you have choke points in your communication that are battery powered. So, what you don't want you what you don't want to do is to design a system where you have a device that reports every half second with a big battery, and it, and it that, but it sends messages through another device that has a little battery. Obviously, the, the big de the big device will run down the battery of the little device. Um, so, again, the um, that, that that's 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 the kind of thing that quick that quickly gets shaken out. You know, if you if you follow good rules of thumb while you're setting up your network to generally avoid problems like that. Um, did I answer the question, Andre? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we need to go ahead and and, um, and stop. Uh, so, uh, again, I appreciate all the attendance. There will be um, two more webinars in this series about ISA 100. And so just keep an eye out for the uh, email notifications for those. And uh, again, I thank you uh, for participating. So we're going to go ahead and sign off and give you back the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.